<laughs> Hello, can you guys hear the music?
Thank you all for coming. Um, this is the first one I've done of these and I've wanted to do this for a long time. So um, let's just get started. Uh, I've got a bunch of screen shares. So I'm gonna start with one, which is, this is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about Dvorak. We're gonna talk about the guy. We're gonna talk about uh, his life, like what, where he came from, what, what he did, the time he lived in, and the musical time he lived in. We'll talk about the story, the plot, the characters, their leitmotifs. We'll talk about this production, and then we'll talk about a bunch of stuff that I just want to talk about. Um, so let's just get started. Um, oh, no, actually, I love Dvorak's music. I've loved Dvorak's music since I was a kid. Uh, Suzuki, the Suzuki books put a lot of uh, Dvorak music in, in their little, in their books. Um, from the New World Symphony, we learned, hang on, we learned. But we also learned the slow movement. That's the last movement of the New World Symphony. Uh, we also learned in the Suzuki, we learned the slow movement, which is the reason I'm playing those is, and we'll talk about it later, but Dvorak was interested in folk music. And I have this theory that folk music around the globe is similar in the sense that it's modal and it tends to be pentatonic. So pentatonic literally is a five note scale. And if you can picture a piano, uh, it's the black notes. So it's And there's a lot of folk music that uses those notes that is incredibly evocative and, uh, and we feel it in a different way than we feel uh, uh, traditional classical music. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, the, the pieces of Dvorak's that I love uh, are the New World Symphony, like everybody, but also the American String Quartet. Um, and the American String Quartet includes um, some bird song in it. Uh, Dvorak was living in, in Iowa, which I will tell you about later. Um, and outside his bird was this, outside his window was this bird called a scarlet tanager. And if you, if you, um, if you listen to the piece, you'll hear it in the third movement. Um, also, when I was in, when I, at, when I was first in the Met, the Met, the orchestra started doing symphonic concerts at Carnegie Hall. And it was incredibly uh, em, em, emotional for all of us to be playing on stage, to be playing symphonic music. One of the pieces we played early on, I think it was 1995, our concert master at the time, uh, Ray Knivik, he played Dvorak's Romance which I'm not even gonna try and play. It is such a beautiful piece. Um, just gorgeous and heartfelt and just beautiful. Um, also in the Suzuki books is this piece called A Humoresque, which I am gonna try and play for you uh, just a little bit because it, it, it gives the breadth of the scope of, of what, he, what, he, what he wrote for people. So. It goes like this. So folksy, pleasant, just charming music. Um, just lovely. So Dvorak was, he's a country guy. That's what you have to remember about him. Country guy, pious, simple, he loves nature. And above all, he really, really loved um, the folk, folk songs, native national music. He just was really proud of his heritage. And he, he wanted to somehow find a way to, um, to, to export it. He was born in 1841, the son of a butcher. Um, he, like all kids in those days, he got a musical training. He studied organ, violin, piano, and music theory. 
And by the time he was a, a young teen, it was, it was clear that he was very gifted and his teachers encouraged his parents to send him to conservatory. Uh, he went to the conservatory in Prague where uh, all the learning was in German because uh, the, those countries, Moravia, Bohemia, were under Austro, Austrian, Hungarian rule. And so all of the, all of the language was, was German. Um, after he graduated, he was unable to find a job as an organist. And so he got a job as a violist. I can't hear you laughing, but uh, he got a job as a violist in an orchestra uh, led by a guy named Karl Komzak, who basically played in restaurants and balls. They did some concert, but it was basically, that was the entertainment of the time, and that's how you made money. In 1863, the orchestra was, had a guest conductor. They did a, a complete concert of Wagner's music, and Wagner conducted. This made a huge impression on Dvorak. It influenced his music forever. You can hear, that that's a lecture for another time, but you can hear the influence of Wagner in almost every piece that he, that he wrote, and certainly in this opera. His main income was from teaching and performing, um, but he was still composing. And in 1874, he was newly married and he needed some money. So he entered 15 composi comp compositions into a composition competition uh, of the Austrian State Music Prize. It was set up to assist struggling music musicians with their creative pursuits. Dvorak didn't know this, but Brahms was on the, the jury panel. And Dvorak won in 1874 and in 1876 and in 1877, at which point, Brahms took him under his wing and said, look, I think you really should pursue this. He set him up with his own publisher, a guy named Fritz Simrock. And uh, Simrock actually commissioned uh, Dvorak to, to write a piece. And he wrote uh, Slavonic dances, which were very popular and increased his fame and his uh, his, his scope of people who wanted him to write things. Uh, in, oh, in, uh, in 1893, uh, 92, 92, he was invited to New York by a rich uh, socialite who had this idea to start a music school <coughs> um, for uh, indigenous students, so African American and Native American, and she thought it would be a great idea if Dvorak would be the director of this school. Um, it was called the National Conservatory of Music, and it was on 17th Street, and it no longer exists. Uh, Dvorak was unwilling to come. He really didn't want to leave his home. He didn't want to, he didn't want to travel. He didn't want to, he didn't want to be away from home. Um, and she offered him $15,000 a year, which was 25 times the amount he was making in a year. And eventually his wife said, look, we're going. So they went to New York and um, New York was a little too busy and too hectic for uh, Dvorak and an assistant of his suggested that he go and spend the summer in Iowa in a town called Spillville, where there was a population of Bohemian immigrants, Bohemian in the sense of Bohemia and Moravia. Um, and on his way out there, they stopped in Chicago at the World Columbian Exposition Quadris Quadricentennial. It was basically a, uh, 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 needs to be muted. a um, it was a, like a rodeo. So he saw Buffalo Bill. He, he heard Native American, uh, Stephanie, somebody needs to be muted. Okay. Uh, he saw Native American, he heard Native American. He may have, Scott Joplin was, he goes, he, he goes to this, this rodeo and he hears this music and then he gets to Spillville and he's, 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 um, he's like bursting with music. He gets there and he writes the American String Quartet, 
which I don't know if any of you have heard it, but it's a fantastic piece. He writes it in three days. He just, it just comes spilling out of him. And he had been commissioned to write um, a symphony for the New York Philharmonic. And uh, he, he wrote uh, symphony number nine, the New World Symphony. Um, and it, the New World Symphony is not only based on the, the indigenous native music that he heard that was probably in him anyway, but it's also based on Longfellow's poem, poem Hiawatha. So this is also something that becomes interesting to him, that not only the native music, but to have music that has a story to it, music that is what we say programmed. And it doesn't, it doesn't require a, 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 a singer or a set or a stage or anything. You hear this music and you can tell the story. You, you hear it happening. Um, okay. Anyway, those three years in, in the United States were incredibly pr prolific, but he gets homesick. In 1895, he returns back home and he's puzzled because in addition to having written nine symphonies, he at that point also had written nine operas and yet he's really only known for as a, as an, a symphonic con composer. And in those days, operas were, were what, what got people into the theater. Opera was the way you made money and it was what, what made you popular and what, what, what made, gave you a reputation. And he, he wanted his opera composing to be taken seriously outside of Bohemia. Um, and so he, he, he starts, okay. So going on at the same time was a, a, like a revolution of, of national uh, culture in Europe. The, let me back up for a second. The Habsburgs had been the rulers of most of Europe from 1562 to 1780. This meant that when opera was developing at the beginning of the 1600s, all of it was in German. So the German, the, the opera idiom was a real, really German thing. It was also Italian a little later, but it was really a German uh, development. And um, so this, this, this idea of this old thing where it's uh, old is this way, German, and then this new thing, which is national, which is where people started having their pride in their, in their, in their, in their local culture, um, starts like in the 19th century. The, the Italians oust the Austrians in 1849 and Verdi writes an opera, which I can't remember the name of right now. I wanna say it's, our, it's not Armida, it's, anyway. Um, and small localities invest in their native languages in a desire to create national literature. They, they want their heritage to be uh, expounded. Um, still though, in this time, smaller peasant ethnicities like the Czech people are still pushed to the wayside and this irritates Dvorak no end. Um, he, he bristles that his people that have an incredibly rich culture and, um, and, and a long past would be minimized. Um, and so he becomes determined to write a body of Czech music that's, that's, that's theirs. Um, at, at this time in the late eight, 1880s, even though, so uh, what, what I think of as Czechoslovakia, what is the Czech Republic and Slovakia is, was in those, case, in those days, Moravia and Bohemia, and they are um, sandwiched by <clears throat> Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Poland, set in there and dominated by, by German people. And in that time, by the 1880s, the demographics of that area was 60% Czech and 40% German. And so this, this Czech identity begins to, to find a voice. Um, and at this time also, not only in music, there's poets and writers who are writing and rewriting folk, folk tales. They are, um, they're finding old folk, folk stories and rewriting them, repackaging them. And, um, and the, the, okay, so you've got this happening. So in 1896, 
um, Dvorak comes back from the, from the United States and he's thrilled to be home. And he almost immediately sets four uh, legends as uh, tone poems for a sym symphony. Um, and these, were, these would have been legends that, w that his people knew as well as we know, let's say, The Little Mermaid. Right? It's just stories that you grow up hearing as a kid. So the four, the four pieces he writes for symphonic poem are Water Goblins, The Noon Witch, The Golden Spinning Wheel, and The Wild Dove. And these are fantastic pieces, but he still is not getting the credit he wants. And he, he even though a symphonic tone poem is a musical piece that has a storyline which is heard, and that's how you know it's that piece. Symphonies were not as popular, not well attended, not just not. So he, so Dvorak turns his attention to dramatic works. He wrote several operas before he he found this subject, this Rusalka subject, which is quintessentially Czech. It's 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 very um, it's a very common Czech folktale story. And he comes to believe that opera, in fact, is the best way of conveying this national uh, identity, of, of, of this folk identity. And he is successful in, in Rusalka. And the way he found this story was there was a young poet who had been, uh, there, were, there were two, earlier there were two I can't say their names, but there were poets who in this revivalist time were reimagining and rewriting these old folk stories that, that had been just spoken. Um, and this young, this young poet, his name is Yaroslav Kvapil, and uh, he, he followed in these footsteps of these, these writers from earlier. And he is, he is 30 years younger than Dvorak, and Dvorak is in his late 50s at this point. And this, this guy, answers an advertisement. Dvorak was looking for stories. And he answers an advertisement um, about, uh, from this, this guy, and they, they, they make this, this, uh, this partnership. So Dvorak, in his life, he straddles two time periods. He comes from the romantic tradition, and he is going into the modern tradition. So before him, there is like Brahms and Chopin is on the, the cusp, but Brahms is the best example. Tchaikovsky, these, these romantic composers where the music gives you a sense of satisfaction and uh, it's defined cadences and the, the harmony is pretty predictable. Um, I've basically tried to um, give you opera composers here. And the, and the works that they are mainly main, m known for. And I tried to do this. So these are the, this is the time in which these people lived. And Dvorak would have known all of these people. He may have not known them personally, but he for sure knew their music. Um, so he, he comes from the, the Romantic period and he is on his way. He is in a time that is going into something more modern impressionist like uh, Debussy or expressionist like Strauss, uh, Electra. And there's also in this time a shift from sort of pure music, academic music, so pieces that have a title like Symphony Number no. 9 or uh, Quartet in F. And we go to pieces like Don Juan or Don Quixote or Mahler symphonies often have a programmed uh, element to them. So Mahler symphony number two, Totenfeuer, fire, funeral rites. Right, and, and so in this time, these composers are, he, he, this is the bridge. Um, and he's, he's, this is where he is. All right, so let's look at the story of, of Rusalka. The official title is Rusalka, a lyrical fairy tale. So while it is a fairy tale, like we know it, there's a witch, there's a curse, there's a magic potion, there's a real conflict between good and evil. It's not a fairy tale the way we like it because it doesn't have a happy ending. So it's a sad. So the basic stories, and I'm going to read now because 
I don't want to leave out details. Rusalka is a lonely water nymph. She longs for the love of a human prince who she has seen along the banks of the lake where she lives. Her father, Vodnik, the water goblin, is reticent to encourage her, but he loves her and it's his daughter, so he support it, supports her. And he suggests that she go see and get advice from Jeji Baba, who is the witch. So Jeji Baba gives Rusalka a magic potion that will transform her into human form, but at a huge cost, she will lose her voice. In addition, if the object of her love is not true, then both she and the prince will be cursed for eternity. Rusalka takes the potion and drinks. And the prince comes through the woods on a hunting party, and he sees her there at the edge of the lake. And he says something like, are you mute and you cannot speak? I don't know how long you will last, but I'm taking you home with me. And he carries her off. Back at the palace, Rusalka just doesn't fit in. It is suspicious to the other guests that she does not talk and they are wary of her. The prince soon loses interest and starts up with the foreign princess. He canoodles with her a little bit. He rejects Rusalka, who returns to the lake, where the opulence of the beautiful nature from Act One is in shambles. Jeji Baba says that the only way to reverse the curse is to kill the prince with a magic dagger. Rusalka can't do it and she flings the dagger into the lake. Jiji Baba tells her that she will be condemned to live at the bottom of the lake, luring humans to their death. Rusalka says she would rather live a cursed life than kill her prince, and she pay, prays for his redemption. Dvorak found this ending a little too harsh, and so he writes in musical and narrative catharsis. At the end of the opera, the prince comes to the lake seeking repentance. He finds Rusalka and begs him to kiss her. She tells him he will die if she kisses him, and he says he's okay with that. So they kiss, he dies in her arms, and for a moment, they know real love. She asks for mercy on his soul, and she disappears into the depths of the water. In a sense, it's a cautionary tale. If you have to go undergo radical transformation in order to gain love, it's probable that there will be no happy ending for you as you have gone against your own nature in order to become visible. So here are the characters. These characters show up frequently in Slavic folklore in different stories, but the same characters. Yeji Baba, who is also sometimes known as Baba Yaga, she is deformed, ferocious. She's an elderly woman. She lives deep in the forest in a hut and her hut is uh, ringed with stakes with skulls on them sometimes. And her powers are sometimes used for good and sometimes used for bad. It's not always the same in every story. Vodnik, who is a supernatural being, takes different forms in Slavic mythology, but generally he is green, he has gills, he has webbed fingers and toes, scaly green skin. He sort of looks like a vagrant forest creature. He needs to be in water and even when he is out of water, he is wet and dripping and he suffers if he becomes dry. He also uses his power for good or for bad. He can help or hinder. And Rusalkas are, can be a ghost, a water maid, a mermaid. They live in deep ponds. They can come out of the water at night under special circumstances and sing under a full moon, for instance. Also, they can't stay out for long. Dvorak's opera imbues her with the essence of naivete and pureness, but a Rusalka, like the other two, can be a, 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 an evil thing. They can have the reputation as an unclean being with a dangerous spirit. 
An interesting aside, both Vodnik and Rusalka are freshwater creatures. They are not salty, they are not sirens, they don't belong in the ocean. Um, and a personal aside, my feeling is that this opera goes wrong because the prince is a little flaky. He's impulsive. He sees her while he's out hunting and he just takes her home on a whim. And then he gets bored with her exotic nature. She's like a cute pet that just is not doing the tricks. And he starts fooling around with the first pretty face that he sees. So had he just been constant, we wouldn't have had an opera. So um, Dvorak assigns light motifs or musical uh, motives for each character, for the characters and for their emotions and for the situations. Most of the mo motives are introduced during the opera. So when you listen tomorrow night, listen, listen to the music that comes. It's, there's contrasting, uh, he, he, it's, his, the overture is almost just like a, a review. He just says, here's this, here's this, here's this. Um, and you'll hear them and they'll come back. Um, also, Rusalka is often introduced by the harp. It's so beautiful. You just, and the harp is um, the indication of nature. So this, the, the whole thing of the nature, the green, the, the water, all of this. Um, so I'm gonna play for you some of the motives. So the, the overture begins with this Vodnik motive. It goes. And we hear that. And this chart here is not in the order that I wanted to do it, so I'm going to go a little different. Um, so in the beginning, the first thing we hear are the wood sprites. We hear them dancing, and that's their music. Rusalka's music sounds like this. You'll hear that in um, it, 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 it as during the opera it gets lower and lower and lower. I'll play it for you later because this is the last thing in the opera that you hear. Actually, you hear the, the prince too. So there's a humanity motive, which to me sounds awful like Rusalka's motive. <laughs> angst or anticipation motive, which is played by the piccolo a lot. And it sounds like and you hear that all the time and it definitely gives you that feeling of, of nervousness and anxiety. So then we get the moon motive. And all of these things are in horrible keys. Anybody who's a musician, look at the key signature. You'll hear this. Um, you'll hear this a lot, um, and she sings it, and it's so beautiful. If anybody was on the call at the very beginning, I was playing her, 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 the moon song. So, and then here's the prince's uh, motive, and it's very princely. And it's done with horns, and it's very, you know. <laughs> And I'm going to skip to the bottom because the fate motive to me is an inversion of the love, love motive. So here's the fate motive. And play it again. And hold on a second. Here is the end of the opera. So here's the fate thing. And here's where she begs for mercy and the love thing. So he uses these thematic uh, uh, snippets to, to color how the characters are feeling. So here's the moon song.
is probably what made the opera famer, famous. And it sounds an awfully like Somewhere Over the Rainbow and who knows whether that was the inspiration. Um, but it's beautiful music. So I'm gonna go back for one second. Here's Rusalka's motive. You see it at the top there? Right? So here is the viola part from the end of the opera. And you'll see it has the angst theme in it and it has Rusalka's theme. So this is the you hear that and this is where uh, the prince is dead. that he alters the motives during the course of the opera to reflect the action. So as Rusalka's story goes on, her motive gets lower and lower and sadder and sadder as the opera progresses. Critics have pointed out that there is not enough thematic melodic variety in the piece. I think I agree, but I don't find this a problem. Dvorak's motives that he chooses are contrasting. So it's not always the same music, it's different music a lot of time. And it, his, his, the motives that he chooses are well suited for the characters and the action in the drama. He never repeats anything verbatim. It's always a little bit altered. And as such, it propels the drama forward. Uh, his music makes great, contrast, great use of contrast, slow and fast, high and low, deep and twittery. And it's to portray these two worlds, the human and the supernatural, the, the fiery princess and the Rusalka. Um, and just keep your ear out for that as you're, as you're watching tomorrow night. Um, listen for the motives, watch how he paints each character uh, musically and with a contrasting palette. Um, the anxiety theme, this is what I said in the beginning, it's first really high and by the end of the opera it's really low as Rusalka is resigned to her fate. Um, at the very end of the, of the opera, you hear um, the love theme and at the very end, from a distance, you hear the prince's music. You hear you hear that horn thing, it's very muted. And it's just at that moment that Rusalko is gonna go back into the pond and she, as she walks, she wraps herself in the prince's cloak, which he dropped when he came in. Very sad. Um, this production is by Mary Zimmerman, who is really fantastic. Um, and I didn't know this until I watched, and I recommend if any of you have an interest, when the Met does new productions, they do, uh, uh, they do a, um, an interview, a, a Q and A at the Guggenheim with um, the composer, with the composer, with the conductor and the production. And, and it's a, a great way of seeing the antecedents to what happens on stage. So Mary Zimmerman, uh, she uses color and texture in the same way that Dvorak uses sound. So she is creating these environments to, to propel the story. So act one is, is green and lush and shimmery. It's water, it's the, the wood nymphs, it's, it's, um, it's just gorgeous, it's nature. Um, Rusalka's dress is like made from lily pads and it, it's 
it's the dress is designed in a way that it makes it very difficult for her to walk naturally she's a mermaid she can't walk and so the, the singer actually has trouble walking um and that the fabric looks like water it's like gossamer it's just incredible act two is in the palace and the colors are in the palace are from the complete opposite end of the color chart so instead of green and blue it's all red and yellow and deep warm colors um, like maroon and like the dance scene is incredible and Rosalka's dress is sort of blue and they she ends up with a sort of a gray wig so Rosalka just doesn't fit in and she looks cold and uh, misfit um, and the prince I think wonders if her blood is icy in act three we're back in the forest but everything is ruined it's it's in shambles. It's dingy and messy and, and damaged and ruined by everything that happened. Um, we come to blame the prince, but Rusalka can't blame him. Um, all right, so now we're at the part which is miscellany. Uh, Sir Mark Elder, the conductor of this uh, production, uh, discovered this opera, he discovered the manuscript, the score of this opera when he was studying in Cambridge. And he, uh, you know, went into a practice room with a little plunky piano and uh, started banging out the score. And he's like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. But he had no idea what it was about because it was all in check. So now he did and he loves it and he fell in love with it. And from the viewpoint of the pit, this score, is really an integral part of the opera. It's not just that the orchestra is um, accompanying. The orchestra is a character. The orchestra is sets the state, sets the emotional stage, um, and the music stands by itself. Um, years ago, years ago, uh, my parents used to come to the opera, and my mother in one of these Czech operas. I have a feeling it was. Uh, Katya Kabanova. She, after the opera, she said, oh my gosh, she said, the music is so beautiful. I wish those singers would just be quiet. And this opera is not quite like that because the, the musical, the, the voice singing is beautiful, but the, but the music for the orchestra is really, really good. Um, it's great. And, and we really play an equal part. The, the music is not just um pa 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 backup, backup music. Uh, Dvorak, another, this is trivia, Dvorak wrote the entire piece from the end of April to, in 1900 to the end of November. So in seven months, he wrote the entire opera, which is a phenomenally fast time to, to, to compose an entire opera. Uh, the premiere was in, Pol in Prague in March 31st, 1901, and the uh, the soprano was Rutsena Maturova, and the prince was one of the greatest tenors of the time, a man named Karl Burian. But the premiere was almost canceled because of Burian. I'm going to read you what the music writer Ottokar Surek said. Quote, in a moment of good spirits in gay company, Burian forgot that he was required to keep a clear head for the important and demanding task of the role of the prince which lay ahead of him that evening. The cover tenor was not required to be in the theater for opening night for some reason. And so Dvorak and members of the administration ran to the cover's uh, apartment, a guy named Bohemil Potak, and plead, pled with him that he should just come right away and, and sing. And he did. And uh, the reviews, uh, the, the success of the opera was contributed by, by, his, by his, how well he did. Critics were unanimous on two points. Dvorak's musical setting excels for its uncommon, uncom I'm going to, this is, I'm going to just going to read from this. Uncommonly powerful, broadly arching, lyrical melodies and masterful instrumentation, which subtly evoke the fairy tale world and effectively illustrate the environment in which the plot unfolds. Its great appeal also lies in its musical invention, the imaginative way in which Dvorak paints emotion and character. 
which the reviewer goes on to say compensates for any imperfections in the libretto and for the absence of marked dramatic conflict. And maybe in those days, they liked the operas to have uh, incidental plots that were not key to the, there are lots of operas that have, that are like soap operas. This, this opera has a pretty clear art, narrative arc and it's clean. The Metropolitan Opera premiered this opera in 1993. I was there. And I, like the young maestro, really didn't know what the opera was about. In that time, my children were very young. And as I'm sure all my colleagues can attest, it was about all I could do just to learn the notes of the music. I knew the story was about a nymph who falls in love and it goes badly. But it was not until preparing for this talk that I really knew the details and I'm so happy. So thank you all. The question is, why did it take so long for this piece to be premiered at the Met? Uh, hold on. If you look at when other modern new operas were premiered at the Met, Smetna, the Barter Bride, was composed in 1866 and premiered at the Met 40 years later. Uh, Mus Mussorgsky's Boris Goodenough also took about 40 years. Yenufa was composed in 1904, premiered at the Met 20 years later. And Pelias also about 20 years later. But it took 93 years for Rusalka to come to the Met. I've read two theories about this, um, which are that Dvorak's music wasn't new enough. In 1901, it was a new century and people wanted new and they wanted abrasive and, you know, shocking music. And Dvorak's music was just too nice. It, it was too, um, it was too nice. It wasn't avant-garde enough. The other, the other theory is sort of lame, but I'll tell you which is that, you know, after the 40 years prescribed time when it might have, at that point, the Iron Curtain was up and it was really impossible to get um, native singers uh, to sing in their native tongue. So whoever, I don't know how many of you were listening at the beginning, but that was uh, Gabriela Banachkova, who is the, the, the soprano who did the premiere at the at the Met in 1993. Um, however, her prince was a guy named Neil Rosenshine. So, um, so some more trivia. Dvorak used to summer by a lake. And it, said, it is said that he had a Rusalka, that he knew a Rusalka. And if you're ever in Prague, you can go find his house. It's a Kunik Villa in the Prebrom district. That is, you know, well, we'll travel again. Finally, enjoy watching tomorrow night. The Met does an incredible job. The production value of these, these are from the HD transmissions and one day we'll be back in the movie theater. But they take you backstage in the intermission. So get yourself ready with a glass of wine and all your food because during the intermission, you won't want to get up. They, they show you what it's like best deck backstage and a theater is one of the coolest place to work. Um, and this talk was initially for my friends and family. So I wanted to keep t tell them to keep an eye out for me because I'm sitting right in front of the conductor. That's me. So as you're watching, keep an eye out for me, okay? Um, and that's it. Um, I wanna take questions, but before I take questions, I wanna say thank you to everybody who helped me do this. Um, I really, I, I've had a lot of fun and I'm grateful for the encouragement and all the technical help. So, questions? Uh, should I look on the chat? I successfully, I'm not much of a musician, but I successfully guessed that Somewhere Over the Rainbow somehow figured in that. You know, uh, I, it, was that it was the Somewhere Over the Rainbow inspired by this or it had nothing to do with it? So Somewhere Over the Rainbow is written by Harold Arlen, um, who 
here's a piece of trivia. He had a dog who used to sit on his, on his uh, piano. The dog's name was Schmutz, like Mutt, but Schmutz. Um, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Rusalka, the moon song, came first. However, I don't know that it's, um, I don't know that one has one, one, ha one has something to do with the other. And I will look that up and I will let you know personally. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Oh, second question. Sorry. It's okay. Is that, is that Lake Tahoe behind you? Uh, yes. No. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. I'm in, I'm in Lake Tahoe. Um, oh, I you're already there? I'm already there. I have been living, just for everybody, I have been living in Dallas in this pandemic time. And um, I am in Lake Tahoe because I have one week of work, which is like crack. Like, it's so amazing. <laughs> no, really, that I get to play. I'm just, all of my colleagues who, who are listening or not will, will tell you that what we miss the most is playing with other people in any, in any configuration. We don't, it's not, uh, you know, I miss playing in the orchestra, um, but any kind of playing with another person is, is fantastic, mm. so. Well, we miss. Being seeing there. you, being there. We, we are corona here in Northern Virginia. We will be back. All of it. Life, okay. life, will, life will continue sometime soon. Good. Any other questions? Hi. Hi. Um, sorry, it's getting dark here. <laughs> um, hey, hi. <laughs> I was curious about the timeline you showed about when, between when operas were composed and when they were performed at the Met. And my question is, how, how is that decision made as to when and what is going to be presented at so, the map? So I don't know, but oh, okay. <laughs> but I know, but I can imagine that it that operas that were first of all the Met didn't open until 1883, so an opera that was written in 1866. You know, uh, it, 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 it could take a while, but I can imagine. So the way it works now is the, the, the Met schedules the singers maybe four or five years in advance. Mm -hmm. So the Met wanted to know that it was a good opera before they invested in the rights because you had to pay you know rights and stuff so before the before any theater company would invest in a new opera um, or in a different opera or something that hadn't been done that hadn't been tested they wanted to know that it was really really good um, I don't know why it takes 40 years but it might also be you know the way it works now is somebody from the Met goes to Europe and spends uh, some time going to different opera houses listening to different operas, listening to different singers. And they contract with the singers and they, 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 listen, they, they, they listen to new productions, they listen to new composers, and those decisions are made. And then, and then uh, th that, that decision affects a performance five years in, in, advance, in, in, in the future. And I can imagine that before there was, the, there was uh, uh, air travel, all of this went by boat. And then, and those decisions probably took longer and you wanted to know mm -hmm. if it was really good. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know why 40 years. Right. Okay, thanks. Good question, good question though. Because even three years is a long time. Yeah. There's a question in the chat from Chelsea. Uh, because Dvorak played viola, do you find the viola parts more satisfying yeah. than other composers? <laughs> Yes, yes. You know, there, there are, there are uh, famous operas like Aida, like The Barber of Seville, which are fantastic. Chelsea, you have to show your baby. <laughs> which are fantastic operas, but I hate playing them because the viola part, you play umpapa papa all night long. It's like not a satisfying evening. Yes, I, I like the whole, but, um, but yes, Dvorak wrote really good deal apart. So did Wagner, by the way. Wagner orchestrated really well. Oh, he's asleep. Okay. <laughs> Send me a picture. <laughs> I, 
I have a question, uh, Desiree, myself. Uh, so uh, what are your favorite operas to play for the viola? Um, I love, I love Wagner. Um, you know, and I find that Puccini writes well too. Puccini doesn't always, I mean, most of the, most of the string music is in the first violins, but there are moments that are really juicy in Puccini. Um, you know, I also really enjoy playing operas when the harmonies are, are really good. So like Pel Pelias and Melisande is a lot of tremolo, which is just not a lot of fun, but I love the opera because the sound of the opera is so incredibly uh, unique. How about you? Uh, which viola pieces I like the best? <laughs> no, piccolo parts. <laughs> oh, yeah, hi, I play the piccolo. Um, uh, I like to torture my colleagues <laughs> with, uh, um, well, Otello is one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> it's just amazing from the very beginning to the very end. Um, and um, I mean, Lady Macbeth of Mitsensk is very fun for me. <laughs> No a level. So um, Falstaff is amazing. Yep. I love anything that um, where I get to play lyrically. Uh, the piccolo is often used more like a brass instrument uh, with punctuations here and there. But but a lot like a lot of opera composers uh, use the piccolo more melodically, and that's what I like to do is use the sound and and uh, expression. Mm -hmm. in, and the instrument, which is not uh, how it's normally thought of. So. You just made me think of something about this Rusalka. So that motive, bum, da 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 drum, bum, is also in the timpani and in percussion. So she's like singing something lyrical, and in the, underneath you hear da 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 da, like that. So like the, the the way she was saying that that the the piccolo is used as 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 a as a a brass instrument or a, or a percussion that that Dvorak does this he uses he uses instruments um as percussion or uh what they call that in a, in a rock band the rhythm section um and uh listen for that um and you also said something that made me think something else oh i know what it was if if i can get the the schedule of the from the met in advance of what they're going to do i'll do more of these it just happened that on Sunday, I saw that Rusalka was Friday, Friday night and I love this opera. So. so hopefully you guys will join me again and I wanna say thank you to everybody who came. Are there any more questions? No. Okay, everybody have a good night. Bye. Bye. Thanks, bye you guys. Bye.